We're back here at the NRA National Farms Museum down in the vault. Senior curator Phil Schreier has snuck us in the vault to do a handful of curator's corners. Phil, this is so great. This is, wow, I don't know. You talk about a kid in a candy store. <laughs> I don't know how you get out of here, but we're, we're literally in here. Describe again what the NRA, the National Farms Museum vault is like. Well, the vault is about 3,000 square foot room, maybe a little less than that. The museum itself is 15,000, so uh, this is quite a bit smaller than the museum, but it has the same number of guns in here as there are in the museum on exhibit. So do the map. The, yeah. There are a lot of guns in this place. These are three, <laughs> three guns deep and two rows of three guns high, you know, as you go uh, throughout the room. Uh, a lot of people would love to say they got into the back room of the you know, museum, into the vault. Of course, Larry, the cable guy, he enjoyed, you know, his visit down here with Wayne. Uh, and we do get a lot of requests that we have to deny uh, because we just can't bring people down here for a number of reasons. This is in a completely different part of the NRA headquarters, right. not near the museum right. at all. Uh, and the rest of the business of the association, helping service our four and a half million members, uh, takes place daily here. Right. So. The vault is uh, is a part of that, and bringing you know visitors through just isn't practical. Which is why I thought it was such a great idea when you suggested this, because we take our cameras down here right. and give people a peek down here into the vault. So, what we, treasure from the vault do you have for well, us? Well, uh, you know, we don't want to say treasures, because then they'll think we're hiding the treasures here oh, in I'm the sorry. vault. You see? Yes, of course. So they're all upstairs. Uh, actually, the things in the vault, uh, which we may have mentioned before and catch the audience up to uh, today. Uh, are generally things that uh, are duplicates okay. of what we have, where we have a better example upstairs. Uh, a lot of times you'll have a, a you know, a great, you know, gun, uh, but it's been re -blue. Okay. You know, so we, we have one that's not been refinished, you know, on exhibit. Uh, we have type collections down here, guns that represent a, a lifetime of collecting from one collector. Mm -hmm. Melvin Gordon gave us his... Uh, you know, is uh, you know one of his collections. We we have, you know, hundreds of, of Model 70s, uh, can, uh, American long rifles, uh, trap guns. Okay. 1903. Joe Joe LaRubio from Las Vegas. My good friend Joe out there in Vegas gave us a type collection of 1903 Springfields. Uh, these are some of the the better pieces we can put on exhibit. Uh, but for the most part, they're down here in the vault in what we call a type collection, so they can be seen. You know, for those of you that are out there that uh, were involved in gun collecting uh, during its uh, beginning years, uh, the pre-World War II and immediately in the post-World War II era, you might remember uh, the name of Leon Red Jackson of, uh, of Dallas, Texas. Uh, Red Jackson was legend. Uh, in the gun collecting community throughout the world, literally, uh, is being one of the premier uh, dealers of fine antique firearms. Uh, and uh, Red Jackson's shop in Dallas was a mecca. I mean, people, mm -hmm. people flocked to go there. Uh, but he was a very conscientious uh, dealer. You know, a lot, of, a lot of guys aren't so, especially if they've gotten stung on something that was fake. Uh, you know, the unfortunate reaction is, is to try and recoup your money and pass the, you know, the, not Red. Uh, Red would take whatever he saw that was bad off the market so that it would never hurt another gun collector. So he was taking those bumps out of the road so that there'd be smooth driving for those who followed behind him. And one of the things Red did was give the museum a collection of fake guns. Mm -hmm. uh, that had been that had been manufactured to deceive for profit, with the stipulation that they stay in the museum and they can never leave here except as metal shavings. Okay. You know, so uh, to make way for our new 1911 exhibit, we took some of these down. So uh, this is the only way you get to see some of Red Jackson's fabulous fakes, as we call them. Mm -hmm. So today I've got a Patterson. Uh, a lot of folks would recognize the uh, the long barrel as the uh, Texas belt model. Okay. Uh, perhaps the most uh, desired Patterson uh, model there is out there. Uh, 
But upon closer scrutiny, mm -hmm. uh, you will see that this is what they've called uh, as a stretched barrel. Because unfortunately, you can see a little hairline, hairline crack right here. Right. That runs perfectly symmetrical all the way oh, around. You see you that? There you go, yes. That means this barrel was, they call it stretched when it was actually chopped and had an appendage, you know, put on. One way you can tell these things have happened is obviously look for a seam. That's pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. This is almost like stupid pet tricks, you know, <laughs> some, the guy that did this. Uh, the other is inconsistencies in the, uh, in the finish, uh, where one part of the gun might have uh, one hue of blued steel, the other part of the gun a, a slighter shade of, of blued steel. Uh, that's a tip-off. Uh, another tip-off is a universal bad finish that has no inconsistencies in it. Uh, that's evident when somebody's taken navel jelly. We're going to see that in the next gun we look at for the next episode, what navel jelly would do to a gun because it, it, it strips the old finish off but it gives it a, a uniform acid bath. So look. when a gun wears naturally, it has a character to it, a way different to finish at different levels and in right. different ways it wears at different places because of its use. Exactly, or right. where it was stored. If right. this had been in a holster, right. you're going to have muzzle wear and, and cylinder wear right here and along here and all these flat. That's going to wear different. The rust is going to emanate from contact spots and then go out. It's not going to just be all uniform. Right. If it had been sitting in a salt water bath, that's one thing, but most of these things aren't sitting in things like that. There's going to be protected spots on a gun, such as the underside of the hammer, or places that don't get a lot of, of traffic when they're in a holster. Mm -hmm. Like under here, you wouldn't right. see, right in these curves, there wouldn't be a lot of traffic. Uh, the spur on the trigger, when you see something that looks picture perfect, there's generally something wrong with it. So Red, uh, Red wanted us to keep these guns here uh, to uh, educate collectors and also to keep them from being the subject of ruining somebody else's good day. Wow, that's a great thing that he did. That is an interesting, and thank you for that lesson on a fabulous fake. That's pretty yeah, neat. Thanks, Phil. Pretty neat stuff. How can people get more information about the National Firearms Museum and also uh, the Firearms Museum online? Well, we're off the interstate and on the internet. So if you're traveling down Route 66 outside of Washington, D.C., come and visit us at the intersection of Route 50. We're open seven days a week, 9.30 to 5, plenty of parking, free admission. On the internet, uh, we're at national f or nramuseum.org, and that's, of course, 24 hours a day. Right. One of the great things we have right now is uh, uh, every gun in the collection on exhibit right. in the museum has detailed photographs and description available online. A number of those guns, over 80 of them, have their own talking video where right. you know, one of us has sat down and described the gun a little to, uh, to the public. So wow. uh, come by and see that. Visit our YouTube channel. Uh, we've had some... Uh, Sickness going around is viral. I don't know if that's a good thing or bad. I think with video on the internet, that's a good thing. Viral's so a good viral's thing. Viral's good on okay. the internet. Okay. Well, they told me two million people have been infected already. Wow. With one, just one of the episodes. So that is great. That's going well. well so. And it's great you guys share these farms in so many ways with folks who can either, if you can't get here, you can see them either through your website or on your YouTube page on the internet. It's, it's great to, to as many people as possible get to see these wonderful uh, firearms here at the Firearms Museum. And thank you for this sneak peek down here in the vault. We're going to do it again next week. So let's get out of here now and get back in the museum next week for another installment of the Curator's Corner. Thanks, Thanks again, John, for having us on the show.